I want to thank the pastor, the elders, and the people of this church for allowing me to come and fellowship with you this Sabbath. To me, throughout my life, the divine hour is the climax of the Sabbath. From childhood, beginning in my own home where I was grown up, my dad emphasized us to be in church. We grew up staying in the pews. We were sitting in the back. My dad was a church elder throughout my life as I know him. He would stand on the pulpit as he preaches. If I sit wrongly in the back there, he doesn't have to say a word. He would just turn around and frown his eye. It was good enough to put me in place. We grew up in that time. All along, Divine Hour has been a source of joy to me. I learned that when you are in church, nothing else can happen to you because God is there. And I hope that today it will be the same. You'll be able to see Christ face to face. I'm not Christ. Nobody is Christ, but God is with us. And you're going to have that experience. It is the attitude that you bring to it and what you're looking to it that will bless you. May the Lord be with us as we continue to worship him. I want this afternoon for a short period of time to think the cross and your stomach wars. Does what we eat have a bearing on our salvation? That's the question I want to pose to you. Sometimes when you talk about nutrition and salvation, people turn their ears away saying that, hey, preacher, why are you tying my food to salvation? That's legalism. We were saved by grace, grace alone. And we are forgetting that for us to understand this salvation itself, we need to be in good health. You see, so that's why throughout the generation history, you look, we lost Eden because of what? Appetite. The children of Israel, when they were liberated from Egypt coming in too, when God gave them the good food, they said, no, we don't want that kind of food. We need this kind of food. What happened? The whole generation that left Egypt perished in the wilderness. A very good example, when God gave them the good diet, gave them vegetables to eat, nuts and grains, they were living a thousand years. But when they chose to eat meat, they dropped down to 175 years. And look back in the, in the children of Israel crossing. The same time now, even now, we don't live to our full potential when we neglect the what? The diet. My prayer is, every one of us, let us put God first. If we are not going to give up anything for our God, then we are wasting our time coming here. But we need to give up those things that will destroy us and hinder us from hearing his voice. I was working with a young student. You see, I'm a school counselor. So most of my examples, I'm going to give you from the examples that I have worked with. I ask every time when they come to see me, my question is, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Do you hear voices that nobody else hears? No. Do you see things that nobody else sees? Why do I ask those questions? Because I want to see their thinking process. Why are they having problems? Then one boy said, he, used, he gets in trouble all the time. He can just get up from his seat Knock somebody in front of him. Why is he looking back? That's the reason why I knock him out. 
So one day I was asking him, I said, hey, do you, do you see things that nobody sees? He said, no. Do you hear voices that nobody else is hearing? Then he looked at me this day. He said, yeah. I said, what do they say? They say, they say, hit him, hit him. Then I say, what else do you hear? He said, these are two voices. The other one says, come down, come down. But the other one says, hit him, hit him. Then I just got off the seat and hit him. Nutritional deficiencies. It can impair our perception. We can't see things the way they are. We don't hear the, we hear things that nobody else what? Hears. My question to you this morning, what voices are you hearing? Is it the voice of Jesus Christ? Or does it sound like the voice of Jesus Christ? That's my question. So let us have a word of prayer as we go through this. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together. We ask your Holy Spirit to be in this house. Move us. Inspire us to follow you. You are coming very soon. As we wait for your soon coming, let us go out and tell others about this good news. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We're going to do the technology and see if this is going to work for us. Go ahead, the first one. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been entrusted with last warning for the perishing what? world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance they are to allow nothing else to absorb their what? Attention. If you just go back to page 13 of the same, I, I, I really recommend, let me do this. For those of you, if there is a book that you spend most of your time is Minister of Healing, Desire of Ages, and Great Controversy. Those three books, brothers and sisters, they'll do amazing things. That's where I got my medical missionary work. From Minister of Healing. Compassion for people, desire of ages. Then to ground me into the faith is great controversy. You know, prophecy does not come to us to tell us new things, but to light things that God has already what? Given us. Shine light upon it so we can understand it. So as Seventh day Adventist, that's where we need to put our effort. Nothing else should absorb us. But like in the Garden of Eden, let me tell you this, the pure church that he formed in the mid-1800s, the enemy sowed seeds in them. And now we are reaping the fruits of it. Because the battle is not yet over until Christ what? Comes. Let's move to the next one. For as the lightning come out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also be what? The coming of the Son of Man. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the climax of everything that we do. From Genesis, after we lost the garden, in the Garden of Eden, to Revelation, when Eden restored, the coming of Jesus Christ is the second coming of Jesus Christ is the climax of everything that we do. When we talk of the second coming of Jesus Christ, I remember my grandmother was sitting on the porch every morning. We sing these songs, looking forward to the what? To the coming of Jesus Christ. We recited these verses. It says, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds 
with great power and glory. And, and then shall the, he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth, of the uttermost part of heaven. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the climax. I remember seeing her. She's gone now. Looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. They would sing those songs of the saints. I remember those. I have looked forward and I'm still looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's move on. Behold, I show you what? A mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must what? Put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on what? Immortality. Those things going to happen when Christ what? comes. The sea shall give up its dead. All people who died in Christ shall what? Rise up. I know sometimes education has gone, science has gone, say, mm, that's the science of indoctrination. You can't believe that. It's not going to happen. But brothers and sisters, if I die, I want to see Jesus coming. Whether it is a feeble or is a story, I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to hold on to it. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's move on. The world was unprepared. And as he sat on Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things happen? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Then he said to them, Woes and rumors of what? Nations shall rise against what? Famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. Let's move on. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and what? There you go. Food. Marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah what? Entered into the ark. They knew not until the flood what? Came and took them all away. So shall also be coming of the son of the coming of the son of man be you know when you look at what's happening today you can really parallel this is like new york times on the front page writing what is happening let's move to the next slide prophets of global obesity and take heed to yourselves Lest, ye, lest at any time your hearts be what? Overcharged, sifting, and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the what? The whole earth. When you look at global obesity, I was, I was sitting, you know, when you got warmer today, tire change area there. I was just sitting there watching people that are going through. You count them, okay? One, two, three, four, five, twenty. You will find that nine out of ten, they are struggling killing weight. Okay? Just, this is not a study, okay? This is not a study, but you are just looking Two-thirds of the population, two-thirds of our population. Is this coincident? I don't think so. If you really look, this is 
a plan that was orchestrated by most elite people to socially engineer the society. Do you know that there are secret meetings that go on to plan how they can eliminate others and give, leave only people that are intellectuals to solve the world problems? These are things that are not put out there. They gather in secret places around the world. They go Europe, United States of America, Australia. These are secret societies that gather together to socially engineer people. Look at this. During the 1900s, they don't tell us, hey, go to the city, go to the city. But they create situations, okay? that will move us into those situations. And they come back behind us and take all the land we were growing our crops before and begin to grow what? Food. They know that if they go into the city, they're not going to buy their own food. They're not going to grow their own food. In the city, they put ordinances that will suit their agendas. Then you begin to see. Have you been in a subdivision where they tell you you can't put any garden behind your house? You can't do this, even for you to put a deck to sit outside, you got to get a permit from them. They come to come and measure it. These are the laws that are made to suit their word. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you good news. Christ is coming again. And he is building me a what? A mansion where I'm going to be. I don't have to pay rent. The mortgage is already what? Paid. All I'm, I need is Give me my mortgage and put it in my pocket and live with him forever. There are no shovels because if you got a shovel, you're going to dig gold from the, si the golden st streets. So there's no, there are no shovels up there, but worshiping the Lord all the day. Let's move on. In the same scene existed. This is uh, councils on diets and food. Uh, the same scenes exist in our day, which brought the wrath of God upon the world in the days of Noah. Men and women now carry their eating and drinking to gluttony and what? Drunkenness. Is that true? This prevailing scene, the indigestion of the perverted appetite, inflamed the passions of men in the days of Noah and led to general corruption until their violence and crimes reached to the what? To heaven and washed the earth of its moral pollution by a flood. That's, let's move to the next one. The same sins of gratony and drunkenness benumbed the moral sensibilities of the inhabitants of what? Sodom. Even thus shall be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. Since the first surrender of, to appetite Mankind have been growing more and more self-indulgent until health has been sacrificed on the altar of what? Appetite. I see it over and over. Right now, we are counting days. I had a patient. I have a patient. That Now, when I say I have a patient, my job is not natural healing. That is my medical missionary work. My job is a school counselor. But I work with people with chronic illnesses. When the doctors have said, hey, you got three weeks to leave, we can't help you anymore, that's when I go into the home. And most of the times I don't get my things to go into the home. The way you see me, that's when I walk into your house. I begin to look what you have in your house and begin to use those things that are in your house, show you that your kitchen could be a good pharmacy to heal you. You got it, but you just don't know it. Then we begin a plan of education. So this lady was, has been battling cancer for seven years. So she's going to the tail end of it. My wife and I, we went to the home. I brought my juicer to the home. I put the things that I was thinking that these things could be more helpful. 
to the cancer that because they couldn't give her chemo because the cancer is all over the body. So there's no way they can target chemo too. So the only thing they did was, hey, you need to be in hospice. So she didn't want to go to hospice. She wanted to stay home. Then we came in. The difficult thing she could not do is to quit eating the food that are causing the what? The problem. Then her children and her family, we did the best we could. She would not eat it. She wants her chicken, her french fries, her soda, on top of the herbs. <laughs> he said, give me my oatmeal, give me my chicken, give me... <laughs> I sat down on the side of the bed, I said, ma'am, listen, do you want to live or you want to die? And I know we're all going to die, but which way do you want to die? I mean, that's, that's the whole choice. Then, finally, she made her decision. She said, I don't want to do anything. I'll just eat what I can eat right now until the day I'll die. Brothers and sisters, the devil knows where our weaknesses are. And he capitalizes them. Like I told you, food industries are not run by medical doctors, are run by psychologists who study the nutrients, the chemicals that they can put together to enhance their ability to make profit. We don't test the food with our mouth, we test the food with our brain. So they target those chemicals to launch patterns in our brain which are very, very difficult to change once we get used to. All right, let's move on. Of all the lessons to be learned from our Lord's first great temptation, none is more important th than that bearing upon the control of the appetites and what? Passions. In all ages, temptation appearing appealing to the physical nature have been most effectual in corrupting and degrading mankind. Through intemperance, Satan works to destroy the mental and moral powers that God gave to men as a priceless endowment. Thus, it becomes impossible for men to appreciate things of eternal worth. Through sensual indulgence, Satan seeks to blot the soul every trace of likeness to God. I want you to really record this, and I mean, I want you to read this, because the whole chapter, what she's, she's talking up there, it is very, very true. You can put it line upon line, what is happening. And I see it every day. Do you remember when I was growing up, we never used to, to hear about autism. Anyway, it was very rare. But right now, we have four classes in elementary school just for that disability. Why? We don't have to fall into that trouble, brothers and sisters. God still works today. He is still healing people today. He can change us today. All right? Let's move. Denver's Lambert Brothers meets issued a July 4th Eve recall of approximately 26,975 pounds of tenderized steak and ground beef products that may be contaminated what? With E. coli. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Inspection Services, let's move on. Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principles. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his laws is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage the firmness, the most influencing, to stand in the defense of the truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, 
This will be our word, our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. The captain of our salvation will strengthen his people for the conflict in which they must what? Engage. Let's move on. Now is the time when we should closely connect with God that we may be hid when fears of this warmth is poured upon the sons of men. All who will gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their defections, and loyalty from their treason, will triumph with the third angel's message. That's from Sons and Daughters of God, page 201. There's promise. These are real indeed promise. When everybody else is turning their back from these principles, let us not turn our backs from it. Let every day when we walk out into Walmart coming out, the cashier should be able to ask, ma'am, there's no food there. Where? Where's the food? Then you tell them, yes, this is the food that God what? It will strike you to give them the third angel's what? Message. You shall see. We shall revive. Let's move on. The inhabitants of the antediluvians world were intemperate in eating and drinking. They would have fresh meats. Although God had at the time given men no what? Permission to eat animal food. They ate and drank till the indulgence of their what? Deprived appetite. Knew no bounds. And they became so corrupt that God could bear with them no more. As you see, the strength of this is going on. We are reaching that point. You know, when you just turn the television, there are horrendous things. You wonder, why would a human being treat another human being like that? You know what I mean? In a smaller scale, I live in a country, okay? When someone is murdered, it's big news. But just murdering people anywhere, you go to the big city like Atlanta, I mean, they are pulling bodies of dead people every day. You know, killing another person like you're killing a chicken, that's inhumane. Do you know that God has inbuilt compassion in us through the frontal lobe? Nine things that make up our frontal lobe, I mean the prefrontal cortex. Just between, when you put your, you see, when you do your brain like this, this is the frontal lobe, okay? But the prefrontal cortex is these two center points, right between our eyes. That's where compassion is. When all our brain, when I talk about brain, I mean every part of us, starting from the toe to your head, is connected there. When one part is not connected, you are dysfunctional. Because you have to be connected to the prefrontal cortex. Because the prefrontal cortex is where the moral judgment comes from. For me to see you as a human being, to do loving things to you, it comes from the what? The frontal cortex, frontal lobe cortex. Once that is being disconnected, you are unable to do that. I can walk to you, snap your pocketbook from your hand without thinking about it. I just need what I want from that. You are getting in my way. Get out of what? My way. By any means I can. And when I tell that food causes that, it is true. All right, let's move. For he shall be great. Now, look at this. If food was not important, do you think God would give a prescription for the person that's going to welcome the coming of Jesus? John the Baptist. His mother was given a diet that he, she should follow and even prescribe when he grows. God knows the importance of food. My emphasis is you have to understand that the health laws, 
and the moral law, they are interchangeable. You can't keep one and break the other. There's no way you can do that. You can't say, okay, I'll keep the Ten Commandments, but I'm going to eat what I want. Don't fall. You don't sleep on time, okay? You don't sleep on time. You know, I was, I was talking to one of my kids. I said, what time do you go to bed? <laughs> then he said, well, I go to bed at 8.30. Okay? I said, oh, that's good. Now, when you go to bed, to your room to go to bed, 8.30, how long does it take you to fall asleep? You know, those are two different questions. <laughs> then he said, well, maybe around 10, 11. Then I said, okay, what do you do between 8.30 and the time you fall asleep? He said, well, I got, I got a cartoon program that I watch. Then I said, oh, you have a TV in your room? He said, yeah. Then do you turn it off when you fall asleep? He said, no. Okay. Then I move on to ask another question. I said, so what time do you get up in the morning? Then he said, maybe one o'clock or two o'clock. I said, what? One o'clock or two o'clock? Most of the times, if I sleep long, I might go about 2.30. Then I say, huh, so what do you do when you get up? He said, my brother snores a lot. So, <laughs> so I go to the front room to play my what? Video games until the time the bus comes, me, comes to get me to, to school. Now, so I finish my session with him, take him back to class. I come back, I pick up the phone, dial his mom. I say, hey, mom. Hey, Mr. Ban, how are you doing? I say, no, I'm not doing so good. I say, what's the matter? I say, I want to ask you some questions. Do you know, how does John sleep? What, what do you know, why does John sleep? Oh, John sleeps very good. <laughs> he goes to bed at 8. 8.30, maybe 8 o'clock, 8.30, but we can allow them maybe to go about 9.30, but I don't allow them to go to bed around 10, um, but I make sure that they go to bed. I say, okay, have you ever gotten up at midnight to go and check to make sure that John is in bed? No, when I was doing the conversation, I asked him, does your mom know that you are having trouble to sleep? He said, yeah, she knows, because she sleeps by... Um, the front room. So she knows I'm in the living room playing my video games. When did you start? Has been going on since first grade. Now he's in fourth grade. Do you see? But to make a long story short, I didn't say, oh no, he says this. I didn't say that. But what I did, I gave an assignment. I said, I want you to time your phone. Plan it to wake you up at 12 o'clock to wake you up at 3 o'clock to wake you up at 5 o'clock. And these times I want you to go and check to make sure that John is in bed. Then we're going to talk after a week when I see him again. But do you see, parents, all the problem that we are seeing there will culminate to what? Diet. It was very important that we feed our body. Because God know us better. He made us and he gave us the prescription what we needed to do. Let's move. In this fearful time, just before Christ is to come the second time, God's faithful preachers will have to bear a still more pointed testimony than was born by what? John the Baptist. A, res a responsible, important work is before them. And those who speak smooth things, God will not acknowledge as his shepherds. A fearful war is upon them. We must sound the alarm, educate the people, 
Do you know how many people don't know the effects of food? I was talking to a mom this week. The role of food additives on their children. He said, what are food additives? They are eating them unknowingly. I said, food additives are things that have no nutritional value whatsoever to your body. But they put them there to enhance the marketability of that product. So that when you look at it, you can buy it. You see, they take good things, give it to animals, and the remaining ones, because they don't look good, they shine them with the food additives so that we can buy them. So, educating them. Let's move on. Go ahead. Is that the end? Oh. What happened? Move back again, let's see. I have several, I have, this was, I was going to go into some aspects. But anyway, since we are at the end of it, do I still have time? It's okay, five or 10 minutes. All right, but you got the genesis of it. From Genesis to Revelation, God is bringing us back to, its ori to our original state. When you read in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, we know that we are not going to be having a knife and running after cows and after chicken to cut their heads so that we can eat them. We are not going to do that. He said the leaves shall be the healing of the what? The nations. Do you know that if you are suffering with any sickness, eh, just quit eating and drink lots of water. You give your digestive system time to what? To rest. Then you're going to clear out the allergies that were accumulated in your system. Then you begin. Now, if you're going to do that, do you have to go back to the food you were eating before? No. You move on to the what? To good food. That's where you become a student to know which foods are good for me. You see, not all car greens are made the same. You know, Crimson University has been keeping the nutrient value of foods. One of them is tomatoes. How much nutrients is in tomatoes? grown in South Carolina. It's on their website. The tomatoes that were grown in 1961, you only needed half a tomato to meet the dairy requirements for lycopene. Okay? But today, same state, you need 10 of them. So, don't we need to study and be aware of where our food is coming from? Maybe possibly to grow our own and nurture them the way the Lord said they should so that they can give us the nutrients we need. I was talking to a young mother. He said, I can afford to buy organic. I'm buying organic. But I don't see the changes. Is there anything else you can help me with? Then my question is, how much are you eating? I eat a bowl of salad. I eat a cup of beans. I eat half a sweet potato. I said, yeah, it fills your stomach. But nutrient-wise, is not what? Enough. You know, food is different from medicine. Medicine, when they tell you take half a pill and you go ahead and take four of them, pretty much the pastor is going to sing the songs and eulogize you. <laughs> but you eat food, hey, you're just going to have a sour stomach. 
couple times to the bathroom, you're good to go. I'll give you an example. What happened? I had a, a cold. I went to buy vitamin A. You know that vitamin A is an antibiotic. Do you know that? Vitamin A is an antibiotic. When you convert vitamin A into your body, it becomes an antibiotic to kill germs in the body. So I was having this cold. I wanted to take 100,000 IUs of vitamin A. So in th on the bottle, they said 100 pills, okay? But it was 10,000. So in my eyes when I was reading, I was reading like what? A thousand. That's a difference. 10,000 and 1,000, that's a different. You know, see? So, 100, I want 100,000, 1,000 a pill. How many pills should I take? <laughs> How many pills should I take? That's a, a hundred. So, I, I took the bottle. There were small pills. Fall up with water. In the evening, I did the same thing. The following day, because I had to do this for three days, the following day, I mean, I took the bottle. I never checked it back, put it in my hand, swallow with water. In the evening, I ask my wife, go get my vitamin A, I want to eat. She's bringing 10 in the hand. I said, I need the whole bottle. He said, honey, this is 10,000 appeal. That's when it dawned in my mind. I'm standing before you. You do that with Adderall. <laughs> you will be six feet underground. That's why I'm saying that natural food will only bruise you when you overdo it. But you know what I felt? I felt much, so much, so much, much better. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go and do that, okay? But what I'm saying is there's a difference between food and drugs. When you are taking a drug, you've got to follow specific instructions. But when you are following foods, I mean, definitely it won't hurt. If you are hurting more, take more. I had a guy that had back, lost his back pain. I mean, he, with back pain. It fell out on him. He was laying in his kitchen floor. His wife, because he was a little bit heavier, his wife could not get him off the floor to put him in bed. Brother Banda. What should I do? I went there. GNC. Brom bromelin. You know, bromelin is a chemical that, I mean, it's a compound that comes from what? Pineapples. Yeah. I put bromelin, took up there. I made my concussion, you know, chia seed, you know, no more things. So I gave him 25,000 milligrams of bromelin before I gave him the concussion. It only took 15 minutes. We were talking, we were standing there, talking. Within 15 minutes, that man got up, went to his what? Bedroom. He sat for five minutes. He came back. We sat in the kitchen table. I mean, on the living room, talking. His wife was saying, you know, honey, you are faking it. You are faking it. I said, no, he's not faking it. His back went out. He couldn't get up off the floor. It's because of what? Inflammation. God's things are so simple that even a child could what? Do it. But when you take medicine, you have to follow specific instructions. When you swallow it, you can't go in and pull it out. It's gone for good. You can say, hey, let me pull it out. No, it's not. It's the wrong one. Let me pull it out. You can't do that. Food, you just watch it coming from there. <laughs> That's it. It will do a little bit of damage, bruise you, but you rush up yourself and you go on your business. May the Lord bless you, be with you as you contemplate this message, the second coming of Jesus Christ. We don't have to deal with these things. He shall crown us off and we shall live with him forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much 
for the blessed hope, your second coming. What could we do without this message of hope? Knowing that when we go through trials, time is coming. Be with us, bless us, keep us as we continue to worship you in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen.